my project on industry-specific corporate culture. So the idea that we have something like industry-specific corporate cultures is well established in the literature. Naturally, the culture of a supermarket chain tends to be different than the culture of, let's say, a bank or an IT startup. However, what happens when a firm deviates very strongly from the dominant culture of the industry? Is this something that tends to have positive effects on firm performance, or does it tend to have, uh, or does it tend to bring problems to firm? As this has received um, less interest in the literature, this will actually be my main research question. So the association between deviations from industry averages of culture and firm performance, in particular productivity. And I will address this research question by looking at a large data set of online employee reviews where I will measure corporate culture based on the free text from these reviews. But before I say anything more, what do I mean when I speak of corporate culture? So I follow this definition of corporate culture as a system of shared values that outline to employees how they should behave. Are they encouraged to take risks or should they behave very safely and avoid taking any risks? And correspondingly, I will use two prominent measurement framework that try to describe or measure which kind of values or which kind of behaviors um, are strongly desi desirable in a firm. So the CVF and the OCP, in the interest of time, I will talk only about the CVF today, but my results for the OCP are fairly similar. So here we have a quick overview for the, for the CVF. It has four different cult types or dimensions. Uh, each dimension being associated with different assumptions, values, behaviors, and effectiveness criteria. So for instance, there's uh, the clan culture that is associated with teamwork and open communication. Autocracy is about innovation and risk-taking. Market about achievement and competition. And finally, we have a hierarchy dimension that talks about stability and predictability. And what I will do is to see how strongly each of these dimensions will be emphasized in the free text. And what has been done initially quite often in the literature was trying to find out which of these dimensions are positively associated with firm performance. So for instance, it seems to be that a market-oriented culture is positively associated with firm performance. However, there are some indications that this culture performance link is quite contingent on some various aspects. So in which nation do you operate, or in which industry do you operate? And I will actually focus on this contingency of industry belonging for the culture performance link. But why should we actually expect that industry belonging is something that should affect the effectiveness of, of a certain cultural trait? So the interesting thing about um, industries is that within industries, Firms share a variety of common features. So they share a similar regulatory environment, they share similar customer taste, and have a similar production function. Um, so therefore, it's not surprising that we find that cultures and the culture performance link differs by industry. Because according to contingency theory, we would expect that culture is something that needs to fit to these contingencies that are fairly similar for each industry members. However, this doesn't answer the question if it's a good thing to deviate from dominant culture types. And actually, theoretically, this is not entirely clear. Because on the one hand, you might think that these industry averages of culture emerge because they reflect cultural traits that are very suitable for the corresponding environment. And if you deviate, it means that you miss out what would be the suitable cultural traits. But you might also think of rational reasons to deviate. So for instance, in order to fit your strategy or um, special uh, product features. Or you might also think that over time you need to deviate from traditional industry values in order to adopt to, the ch to, a, to a changing environment. Now since theoretically it's not entirely clear, I found it an interesting empirical question, which I will address by matching culture data from online employee reviews with performance data. I will only look at the US and I will look at the time period from 2008 to 2017. So I think most of you are familiar with online employee reviews. You can rate your employer from a rating from one to five and also describe what you do and what you do not like about your employer. And I will actually focus on these free texts where employees can also describe how 
the companies actually perceive. And I think a large advantage of looking at online employee reviews is that it gives a very um, diverse picture of how employees actually perceive the organization and not how it is advertised by the top management. Mm, but how do I come up um, with culture scores from these three texts? So I follow an approach um, very similar to Popperduck. Um, I first start with how different culture dimensions were actually described in the literature. So for instance, autocracy is described with uh, words such as innovation, creativity, adaptability. For each of these words, um, I search for synonyms. So for instance, for innovation or inno innovative, this would be words like mm, novelty, novel, groundbreaking. So this gives me for each dimension a large set of words that I would expect to read if the corresponding dimension is strongly emphasized. I call this master text. And then I, s I simply calculate the text similarity between these master texts and the free text from the online reviews, which is basically the relative share, share of words that occur um, or that correspond to these master texts. And then culture scores are standardized for easier interpretation. Now you might think an obvious caveat of this approach is that when many employees write that the company is not innovative and not modern, you don't want to see a high score in the innovation dimension. So in order to take this into account, I um, split each review into sentences and sub-sentences, and whenever a negation word occurs, such as not, never, the meaning is basically reversed. Similarly, um, I also include opposing words, such as unsupportive and uncooperative, which also gets a negative loading. And in a robustness check, I exclude all sentences that contain a negation word. So this gives me, for each firm, a culture score. And here we have a quick overview of average culture scores by the sector level. So note that the sector level is rather broad, and I will later use a more granular industry classification. But here we can also already see that cultures, in fact, vary by field of business. So for instance, the energy sector strongly emphasizes the market dimension and is very low on autocracy or innovative um, cultural values, whereas IT is fairly high on autocracy and very low on hierarchy, which is in line with the idea of um, loose IT startup cultures. Now, my actual interest now lies in the question how strongly firms deviate from these industry averages. And here I will also distinguish um, by the direction of deviation, where, where I will denote it as a positive deviation, when a firm's culture score is higher than, it, than its industry average, and um, as negative deviation, when a firm's culture score is lower than its uh, industry average. Um, and I also construct an index of cultural deviation, which is basically the, the sum of all forms and um, deviations in all dimensions. My main outcome variable will be total factor productivity, which bas basically measures how efficiently input variables are transferred into output variables. And I control for a bunch of firm characteristics and also especially review characteristics, such as how many reviews I actually have for each firm. Mm. Here we can see my main regression output with um, TFP as my outcome variable. In column one, I look at the index, so the overall association, and I actually find a negative association with the coefficient indicating that a one standard deviation increase in deviations from cultural uh, industry averages is associated with a decrease in productivity by 0.13 standard deviations. Now, in columns two to five, I now also distinguish bet between the dimensions and the direction of deviation. And in fact, for the hierarchy and clan dimension, it seems to be that the effect is somewhat symmetric. So that deviation in both directions is equally bad for productivity. Whereas for autocracy and market dimensions, I only find a negative effect for negative deviations, but not so for positive deviations. And for market, I actually also find that positive deviation is positively associated with spam performance. But on the whole, I find support for the finding that deviating from industry averages is negatively associated with productivity. Now you might think that this runs a bit counter to the idea that we know many successful firms that, are, that have highly differentiated products. So for instance, by offering higher quality or higher reliability, 
And we should think that these um, su successful differentiators also need to have a differentiated culture. So for instance, when it um, um, offers very high reliability, we might expect that it has more hierarchical values. And in order to test this, I interact my measure of um, cultural deviation with uh, two common measures of product differentiation, which is R&D expenditures and advertisement expenditures. And in fact, I find um, positive interactions, which, which indicates that this deviation in terms of culture is less of a problem when you're also highly differentiated. And if, in fact, um, the co coefficients indicate that this negative effect actually disappears when your R&D expenditures are one standard deviation above your industry averages of R&D expenditures. Secondly, you might think of very successful disruptors that, like Netflix or Google that arguably also had a very differentiated culture. And in fact, when I look at different outcome uh, um, measures, I only find this negative association for outcome uh, variables that talk about current efficiency, such as productivity that we have seen before, but also for profits and return on assets. Um, when I look on more forward-looking measures of firm performance, such as, market, su such as the market-to-book ratio, which arguably better capture the potential for disruption, um, I find no significant associations anymore. So let me conclude. Um, overall, I find support for uh, this idea that um, in industry limits um, which kind of cultural traits you have with um, deviating very strongly from your industry average of culture being associated with lower productivity and lower profits. However, this is less so the case for highly differentiated firms, which supports this idea that, that corporate culture is something that needs to fit um, to an organization, both external aspects but also internal aspects. Now, but when um, industry averages seem to be at least a good benchmark for a good culture, this um, um, leads to some further questions, which I might address in the future, um, which is first, how do these industry averages actually um, emerge over time and are they very stable? And do we know more about when a deviation might make sense? So for instance, when the industry condition changes. But that's it now for me and I'm happy to give up to the next speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Samir uh, and Jenny, I know who's not here, uh, for organizing the conference and inviting me. Uh, I'm not going to be talking uh, for the next 15 minutes about organizational culture per se, but instead about how culture, defined broadly, organizes the creativity of musical artists. And this is joint work with a uh, host of colleagues across four continents, uh, Noah, uh, Askin, Eric Contain, and Yori Moll. And I want to start by proposing kind of two ideal types of how we might think about creativity in the context of music. One is the kind of individual genius, right? This is Bob Dylan. He collaborated with some folks, but he's known as this kind of cantankerous, like someone who's off on his own island, creating stuff in his own mind, and you know, bringing it to market. You know, the first person to bring, for instance, electronic amplification to folk music. Uh, so this kind of individual genius, kind of Beethovenian model of what it means to be creative versus this other model. This is the Fab Four, right? The Beatles uh, of how together multiple diverse perspectives and experiences can create a creative and new whole, right? So the kind of team-based argument. Uh, and, you know, stated kind of through prose, you know, where do new ideas come from? Here's kind of, again, I'm painting with a broad brush, but here are two kinds of simplistic ways of thinking about this. We can think about individual differences, uh, either differences in ability uh, or motivation or skill that's been learned over time. Uh, and then there are these kind of more contextual, social, or even environmental factors uh, at the very macro level or at the kind of meso level in terms of teams or networks or your position uh, in a network, right? Uh, and I'm going to use this as a kind of jumping off point to think about, you know, the role of social context and the way we think about collaboration and how that might influence creative outcomes. 
Uh, and I want to move away from just thinking about collaboration as some, th something about like direct interaction, for instance, co-authoring with someone, and actually having direct contact with a person, and think about collaboration more broadly. And I think this is one way to think about it. Here's a quote uh, from 2016 uh, from a well-known music producer and kind of playlist curator, Matty Karras. He says, all music is collaboration, even if you are a one-man band writing and recording all the parts in your bedroom, you are collaborating with the ideas of your predecessors and your peers, both consciously and subconsciously, and you're almost certainly nicking random bits of lyrics and melody out of the collective air. And the idea here is that, sure, you might be influenced by the people you're writing the song with, but you're inevitably influenced by a host of other things, both explicit and implicit, conscious, unconscious, that historically we just haven't been able to kind of really get a handle on, on capturing that, certainly at the individual level. Um, so I want to use this as, again as a jumping off point to kind of ask two uh, questions that we're going to try to begin to solve in this paper. One, what are the different sources of influence that might drive variation in creative output? Is it, is it only about direct kind of uh, contact and collaboration in formal networks or is it about other forms of influence? Uh, and then two, how do these different sources exert their influence? So can we get a handle on some of the different mechanisms that might be driving uh, creative influence. Uh, and just to give you a sense in, in the short time I have of the framework we use to think about these different what we call spheres of influence, uh, we come up with four. And I'm not claiming that these four are exhaustive. I think in music they're particularly apropos, but just to give you a sense of the different kinds of spheres of social context that influence happens. One is what we're calling the collaborative sphere. So this is what we typically think of as networks, collaboration networks, defined by direct context in the in the context of music, this might be someone you're in a band with or someone you co-produce a song with. Uh, and then we have three other types, which I would say are all kind of uh, slightly different, but of the same kind. And they're all kind of defined by indirect contact. Right? These aren't people that you necessarily are interacting with day to day, but you have some kind of shared affiliation or proximity to this person or people. Uh, because of shared membership or affiliation in these different kinds of social contexts. So one is what we're calling the cultural sphere, uh, and this is based on cultural similarity. So you might think about like shared language use, or in our case, shared category membership or genre affiliation in the case of music. Um, also a geographic sphere. And the idea here is that being geographically proximate to someone might expose you to similar sets of norms, values, resources, expectations, audiences, competitive forces, uh, even if you don't necessarily interact with or collaborate with a person who is operating in the same city or country. Uh, and I'll talk about the data we use in a little bit. Uh, and then the organizational sphere. Right? So what, what role do organizations play in kind of uh, driving kind of creative production? So sharing an organizational affiliation, uh, you might very well you know, run into the person or work with that person, but you might not. But sharing that organizational affiliation, again, exposes you in a kind of Teresa Mabale sense to a shared set of managerial practices, resources, and norms. Um, so in the case of music, we're looking at shared representation uh, by a particular record label. Okay, so we have, this is, if you think about like musical scenes, and how kind of creativity might be driven by musical scenes. This is one way of kind of unpacking what a musical scene is, right? It might exist along something like these four dimensions. So as I already mentioned, we study how kind of creative influence is carried through these different spheres of influence in the context of music. Uh, we've collected a kind of continually growing exhaustive data set on the kind of different production and consumption dynamics in this space. For this particular analysis I'm going to be sharing with you, uh, the data comes from between 1955 and 2000 and covers almost 30,000 vocal artists and a little over 600,000 individual songs. I'm happy to talk about how we came up with that uh, sample if you have questions. The data comes from kind of two sources. Uh, one is uh, from a kind of music information retrieval uh, warehouse currently owned by Spotify. When we got the data, they weren't yet owned by Spotify called uh, the Echo Nest. Uh, and they develop data that's akin to kind of text analyzed features that we think of in terms of NLP, uh, but in the context of sonic features uh, and musical features and the actual sound of the songs themselves. And I'm going to talk about that data in a second. And the rest of the data comes from an open source uh, data set available uh, online called Music Brains. Um, and the first thing we needed to figure out to do is like, how are we going to measure and operationalize creativity or creative output? Um, 
And if anybody in this room studies creativity, you know, you can understand this as a very kind of messy, uh, longitudinal, contested process, um, and not necessarily like an individual variable. We're going to try to simplify it a little bit and look at the output of a creative process, and particularly look at product distinctiveness or novelty. So I'm not looking at the evaluation of the creative or cultural product or how it's been adopted into the mass market. I'm just looking at the relative distinctiveness or novelty of a song. Um, we can talk about what that captures or what it misses, but that's an important kind of uh, boundary condition of how we're measuring creati creativity or creative output here. Uh, and the way we do it is we use these features uh, that I mentioned that are, that are developed through this kind of arm of computer science called music information retrieval. Uh, and here's a subset of them. And if you know anything about music, uh, you might recognize some of these. Things like the key, the mode, tempo, time signature of a song. Uh, and then we have these other things that are algorithmically derived kind of sensory features of the music itself. So things like acousticness or energy or danceability. Um, and to give you a sense, and I'm happy to answer questions about what each of these individually is, it's important to note that I didn't come up with these features or algorithms, but they kind of have emerged over the last 20, 25 years uh, from this field. And to give you a sense of what a song or a row in our data set looks like, here's an example. Samir, I don't know if you can sing this for us. Um, that was funny. And, uh, okay. Um, and so, you know, and I'm not trying to be flippant. The example here is A Hard Day's Night from the Beatles. I show this because, you know, I'm not arguing that this is ground truth, that this is a completely accurate representation of the infinite complexity that is a cultural product like a song. Uh, but what does, this does allow us to do is kind of consistently and um, compare, you know, compare songs across the space. So if we think of a song as a vector of features, we can kind of scale these features and then start to compare songs in a dyadic pairwise sense and then across some larger comparison set. And that really is the foundation of our measure of creative output or product distinctiveness, right? So here is 10,000 randomly selected songs from a given year. So the dots are songs. The distance between the dots is how similar or different they sound from one another in this multidimensional feature space that's been collapsed here to two dimensions. And then, interestingly, the colors here represent kind of traditional genre designations. And you can see that there is some clustering. You know, and there's, and there's more variance between genres, traditional genres, than within genres. But there's still a fair amount of variance uh, within genres, right? So these, this isn't the same thing necessarily as traditional genre classifications. This is a more continuous way of measuring similarity and difference or proximity, right, within the song space, just to give you a sense. Um, I'm not going to go into details about how we come up with our measure of creative output or product distinctiveness. It's more or less a scaled kind of cosine distance. Uh, measure. The key is really defining the comparison set for a focal song, and we're really looking at songs that are released in the last 10 years from a given focal song. This is the distribution of the measure. So we come up, again, with a single 0 to 1 value, or scaled here 0 to 100 value of a given song in terms of how novel that song is. So if you know popular music at all, maybe not surprisingly, the, the median value is pretty low. Most songs are pretty conventional sounding. Uh, so 19 out of 100, but there is a long tail, right? There are songs that are kind of doing different things uh, in different ways. So that's our dependent variable, creative output. Now, the way we operationalize our independent explanatory variables, this idea of kind of creative influence operating through these different spheres, uh, you know, we tried to measure it two different ways, again, across each of these spheres. And this is a little complex. I'm going to try to go through it quickly and as simply as I can. We thought you know, this might operate through two different mechanisms. Exposure to diverse ideas, so your traditional network kind of brokerage argument, uh, and then this idea of kind of just being surrounded by creative neighbors, right? So this is a more kind of Teresa Mabale argument where like there being normative pressures to, or kind of normative, uh, you know, uh, practices that allow you to uh, be more creative and produce more novel things. Right, so the kind of idea that a rising tide lifts all ships. So if you're in an organization, or you're in a city, or you're in a historical time period where creating new stuff is accepted, even expected, rewarded, that might also drive an individual's creativity. And that's uh, you know, related to, but analytically distinct from exposure to diverse ideas and recombining them in new ways. So we measure this in two different ways. For genre diversity or diversity 
exposure to diverse ideas, we pretty much developed a scaled count of the number of genres, unique genres that you're exposed to in a given sphere. For instance, in the collaborative sphere, and this is updated over time, let's say at a given point in time you have eight collaborators that you've worked with over your career, and let's say across those eight collaborators uh, you've been exposed to 16 unique genres in our data set. So we pretty much develop a scaled count based on those 16 genres, and the scaling is based on how different those genres are from one another based on co-occurrence. Happy to go into more detail if you have questions. Uh, and then the difference across spheres is simply the comparison set. So it's the same measure, the scaled count of unique genres you're exposed to, but the group of alters that you're exposed to changes in each sphere, right? So for the cultural sphere, it's actually yourself. What genres are you, your, except, you yourself exposed to? For the geographic sphere, it's you know who are the other artists operating in your city or in a robustness check country um, that you're producing music in? And in the organizational sphere, it's who in your record label at a given point in time is creating music and what genres uh, are they affiliated with, okay? And then we create a second measure, this alter creativity measure, which is literally using our dependent variables, so this product distinctiveness measure, and aggregating it, again, across each sphere. So for the collaborative sphere, it's the average song novelty or distinctiveness of the artist that you're collaborating with. Right, so you can imagine you're collaborating with a group of artists, and they might be creating uh, really novel songs or really conventional songs. And that might, by proximity, uh, kind of influence you in different ways. And again, we, we then develop this across each sphere using the same fundamental measure across different comparison sets. Using these variables and a host of controls, which uh, I'm not going to show you, but I'm happy to talk about, we we'll then look at the kind of ind independent effect of each of these and interactive effects of each of these on an individual's future creativity. Um, there are lots of different plots and stuff in the paper, which I'm happy to share. I'm just going to show you one here uh, that kind of shows our main result. So these are just standardized coefficients of each of these eight primary uh, effects. They're all positive, uh, and they're all kind of significant just because we have so much data. So maybe that's not surprising. We would expect each of these to have some positive effect on future creativity if you're exposed to more diverse ideas or more creative alters in a given sphere that should drive your own creativity. So they're all positive, uh, but in terms of the you know, substantive significance of the effects, there's one that is really large. And maybe a good uh, effect to compare it to is past creativity at the top there. So that's an individual's own past creativity. So almost like an individual difference. Uh, relative to that, it's really all, it's about being embedded in a genre or genres full of other creative artists at a given point in time. Rather than spanning genres or being in a position of network brokerage, it's really be about being embedded in a genre where you have creative neighbors. Also a pretty large effect for alter creativity in the organizational sphere. So being affiliated with a record label that is kind of producing other creative music in a given year. Um, so in terms of key takeaways, I'm just going to kind of point out three things. One, creative output here is clearly is a function of both the individual and their social context. Uh, and the way we kind of operationalize social context here uh, is not only through kind of direct network ties, which is what literature, at least in sociology, has traditionally done, uh, but also through other forms of more indirect, uh, less explicit connection. And then in the case of music, and I don't claim that this will be true in other industry, you know, in other industry or market context. But in music, creativity is organized by genre rather than networks or categories rather than collaboration networks, which I think makes sense if you know anything about music production, at least historically. Uh, and then two, it's really more about the creativity of your neighbors in this given sphere uh, than network brokerage or category spanning per se, which is some of the existing explanations we have uh, to think about these, these outcomes. Thanks so much. So I'm going to break the norm and stand on this side because I'm a little short. Nobody can see me over that little podium. 
Um, uh, Mr. Menchen, I'm Sue Minto, so thanks for being here. I'm really excited to present some of this work um, that we've been doing, um, relatively new work, and I'm also especially excited that there are many industry people in the room, so it will be great to hear what you think about this work. Um, so I'm also the first person to forget this. Um, so um, my collaborators at LBS and uh, Cambridge University. Um, so really the main um, premise of this study is really trying to get an understanding why people lead the way they do. All right, and um, you know, I, this is actually personally relevant to me. I was asked to be in a leadership position two years ago and I, you know, I, I didn't really identify in that role, but then I had to figure out like, how am I gonna present myself? How am I gonna lead? How am I gonna lead my colleagues? How am I gonna lead? Uh, my staff and, and students and whatever, et cetera, et cetera. Right? And so you know, it's a big question that you know, continues to puzzle me, um, but turns out it's also a relatively interesting research question. And so one of the first things we know that leaders do when they join organizations or join a group um, is to create norms, right? To set direction, create norms, figure out how we're gonna do things, how we're gonna communicate, what we're gonna do, um, how we're gonna do this. Um, and also decide on how we want to reinforce these norms, right? Am I going to be loose on them and I'm going to be always smiling or am I going to be tough, I'm going to be hard, I'm going to be very consistent, I'm going to be like, you know, let's just do whatever we want, right? So whatever the leader does, probably is book for the first 90 days for leadership, right? Uh, really set those norms right away and Shine talks about how really one of the most important things a leader does is to, to create culture, right? And set the norms and the goals for, for the group. So, um, so really important aspect of, um, of being a leader. And so looking at the literature, a lot of what determines or what people have studied um, to understand why leaders lead the way they do or how they lead has looked at personality, for example, right? A lot of your personality traits um, influence how you lead, right? If you're highly agreeable, um, you tend to be maybe more democratic, more consultative. Um, and so on. So more on traits and also how these traits then in turn um, create a culture for the group or the organization, right? So the group's culture reflects the traits of um, a leader. Um, we've got some work um, that we're doing now that looks at childhood and how your childhood experiences may then also how you just how you lead, how you deal with resources in the future. Um, and so this childhood imprint um, could be one um, perspective. Uh, we also see a lot of research and literature on um, training, right? So like coaching and um, skills that leaders can acquire to, to be a certain type of leader, right? Courageous leader, um, you know, transformational leader, and we're all trying to get, you know, leaders to, to learn how to do that. Um, and also, uh, we expect that there has to be some form of diagnosis of the situation, right? What does the group need? Um, what What's the problem that we're trying to solve here as a group or as an organization? What do my followers need? What are they like? What do they prefer? Um, are they you know, highly skilled or experienced or are they uh, sort of novices and, and new and unskilled? Um, so we think it's all of these things um, and really uh, quite, uh, quite um, logically this is sort of idea of a systems perspective, right, as to how we should look at leadership, right? We can't just look at the leader. We really have to look at the leader, the followers, and the context, right? And in this case, the context that we're looking at um, is culture. And so just to give you a, sort of a big picture of what we're looking at in this particular study, uh, we're looking at how cultural tightness has to uh, cultural context, influence how leaders perceive the, the organization and how um, they're their, the people around them um, perceive feminine sort of types of leadership, and that in turn influences what type of leadership they um, adopt, whether they're more directive or empowering. Uh, we look at a couple of other sort of, you know, sort of triangle, the triangle. Um, we're looking at also the leader's gender, so in particular how women perceive these cues in the group, uh, in, in the organization, and how they respond to them um, in terms of how they lead. And also the, um, the gender of their groups, their followers, right? So the, whether the group is predominantly male or female, that sends a different cue as to what um, 
whether or not feminine leadership behaviors are more um, accepted or not, right? So that influences how they lead. And so um, what we suggest is that, you know, cultural tightness, is, you know, we'll, I'll go into more specifics about that, influences um, the experience of women leaders of this stereotype threat, right, when they feel like being masculine. Um, is uh, perhaps uh, more more value than being feminine is, is less value. And so women leaders in particular may feel more threatened in these environments and these tight cultures where, you know, so this control and command type of environment. Um, and, and when the subordinates are male, um, that, that creates an even more threatening environment. So just kind of a summary of what um, we're finding. So as we know, there's this idea of this think leader, think male, so the male leader prototype, right? So leaders are supposed to be um, assertive, strong, have square jaws, and you know, we have deep voices, and so these ideal leadership leader um, prototypes, right? And the, the characteristics are very stereotypically uh, male, right? And so masculine attributes are ascribed to successful managers and executives and we all believe that whether you're male or female and some more than others but um, generally this think leader think male um, idea is quite prevalent uh, in, in in organizations in, in various populations um, and so um, leaders with feminine attributes are often perceived as lacking the necessary attributes to be effective leaders, even though, you know, when we talk about transformational leaders, they tend to have more feminine leadership um, characteristics. But really, there's this sort of stereotype that um, managers should be more masculine, right? And we, we argue that in tight cultures, this, this idea of think leader, think male is um, pro more prevalent and stronger, at least perceived to be so. Um, as we know, um, tight cultures are groups uh, or, or, yeah, groups that have lots of norms, strong norms, and highly reinforced, right? And so that culture um, already itself expects uh, leaders to be monitoring, right, and to be reinforcing, punishing deviants. And so there's this sort of idea that you have to be sort of very sort of masculine sense. Right? And so as a result of that, leaders in, in tight cultures, we argue, would perceive that there's this negative attitude right, towards more feminine types of leadership behavior. Right? So that's sort of our, our basic, um, our first um, hypothesis. And, um, and, so, um, when, and so we argue that when, when, when leaders perceive that there's such an attitude, then they're gonna, they're gonna adapt their, their leadership behaviors accordingly. Right, so um, if we think that their femininity is going to be penalized, we're going to, you know, we're more likely to lead more directively because we think that that's something that's expected by our subordinates and that's what the culture um, expects. Right, and so the stereotypically feminine behaviors are those that are like agreeable, attentive, you know, participative, expressive, empowering, and so you know, those are so the more feminine types of behaviors, and these are then seen to be less. Um, compatible with tight cultures, uh, yeah, tight cultures and then loose cultures. So we propose a, a mediating effect here. And so looking at the moderators, we look at leader gender, right? So as I mentioned earlier, women leaders are probably more likely to see that this is an issue for them and more likely to feel threatened, right? Because their social identity as a woman is gonna be, um, you know, highlighted and salient, whereas the male leaders tend not to have that issue, right? They're gonna think that, oh my, my um, masculinity would be threatened in this sort of more tight culture. Um, but, and so we argue that women are more likely to feel, to perceive, um, uh, or would be more, um, we're more likely to see this phenomenon in, in women leaders, right? The, the, the relationship between cultural tightness and perceive, this perceived negative attitudes, right? So they worry about the possibility of, be, possibility of being judged or being treated unfairly. All right, and then so the third factor, the, the, the next moderating factor is, is the membership or representation of, of gender in um, these groups. And so women leaders would be more likely than male leaders to, to perceive this evaluated bias from their subordinates, particularly their male subordinates. All right, and so um, the contrast between themselves and the group, if it's predominantly male, is more likely to highlight this, this um, evaluation and the threat, right? So when um, their members are predominantly male, um, that threat is gonna be high, even um, more heightened. And so we looked at this in, uh, in the field. So we collected data in, uh, in a, 
a large bank um, in Korea, which had a large number of uh, branches. And so um, we collected this from 159 um, branches in South Korea. We, we collected data from um, the middle managers in each of these branches and also one bank teller, and we picked the most senior one. Um, just to give you a sense of what the banks look like, we have a branch head, and we collected data from the middle managers and the bank tellers. Right? The interesting thing about the structure is that every five years, one middle manager gets moved. Right? So there's sort of a rotation, and get, they get moved to another um, bank teller, and, and within each um, move, well, every year when they, when they make this, this move, there's a stipulation that not more than one uh, middle manager is moved. Right? So there's only at the most one new middle manager within each branch. All right, so we collected data from the middle manager, their perceptions about cultural tightness of their new branches and, and perceived negative attitudes about um, feminine leader behavior. Um, so these are some of the measures, I don't have to go into that. And, and in the second wave, we collected data from their followers and asked them about um, a number of things, about the leader's behavior, and also at that time, we, you know, we kind of looked at um, the ratio of male followers um, to, to, uh, to female followers in each of those branches. All right, as so we control for a bunch of things, um, some of our previous work suggests that cultural tightness in, in the previous group influences people's leadership um, uh, uh, approaches, and so we also controlled for, for that. So we found support for, for our hypothesis that this is a positive relationship um, between cultural tightness and fem the perceived negative attitudes towards feminine leadership behavior. Um, and this, the, this perception in turn influences how, they, how, uh, how people lead. And so we're looking at this at the, for the full population. We're not just looking at women here. Um, and so the greater perceived attitude, negative attitudes is related to directive leadership and negative related to empowering leadership. Um, and we found a mediation effect. And looking at interaction um, as expected, women are more um, influenced by this, the influence of culture um, and, um, on, on, and this perceived negative attitude. We looked at a three-way, again, um, women who had predominantly male subordinates were, you know, showed the strongest um, sort of in, uh, impact of this of a tight culture, tight culture um, and its relationship to this perceived negative attitude. Um, so in summary, we find that these, uh, um, the way people w lead in organizations are influenced by culture, um, the leader's gender, and also um, the subordinates that they lead. So sort of this, again, this sort of systems um, perspective. And this effect is really stronger for, um, I mean, the, the relationship between culture tightness and, and the leadership behaviors is really stronger for um, women leaders. Um, some implications, so as I mentioned, the sort of systems view of leadership is really important for us to start thinking about why leaders lead the way they do, what types of culture they create. Right, and so um, very little work that's kind of combined this thing, the, these three aspects, especially in, in empirical work, because it's really hard, really, really hard to do. Um, for women leaders, uh, we see that there is this conformity. I mean, leaders uh, across both genders, there's some conformity, but particularly for women leaders, this is a uh, need to, um, to conform to expectations. But the problem is that you know, confirmation to one type of uh, stereotype may lead to the violation of another set of stereotypes, and so that might lead to backlash. Um, and so we also wonder about whether this diagnosis is actually accurate. Um, we often just sort of expect that there are these expectations, and we don't, don't maybe necessarily test if that's true. And so you might perceive that this type culture, and so this is, these are sort of expectations, or my male subordinates expect this from me, but you know, we really need to go and figure out and test you know, those stereotypes, right? our own stereotypes about what you know, the, our male uh, colleagues expect or what my, our female colleagues expect. And so there's a bit, you know, there's again, this call for reliance, less reliance on stereotypes and really some sort of more um, diagnosis of what's going on. And I also worry about burnout and dropout of women leaders, not, you know, speaking from, um, from personal experience, I think you know, having to conform to certain norms it's really tiring and trying to figure out, am I doing this, you know, am, am I, you know what, what am I doing, is this right, is this too much or too little? 
um, it's difficult, and so we have to wor be worried or concerned about this from an organization's perspective, um, what kinds of signals we're sending out to our, our leaders. And uh, with that, thank you. So before I get into the specifics of the, so, um, the study, I want to start with an example. Now imagine that a colleague from your department has helped you in something. Now this colleague may have helped you um, thinking that this help is part of a direct exchange where um, she helps you and you're expected to help her back in the near future. Or this colleague may have helped you um, as a service to the community, to your department, thinking that the help is part of a generalized exchange on a group level where she helps you because you're part of her community or, or your group um, and you needed help. And in return, you're expected to help other members that need help in the near future. Now, various factors would affect whether an individual would consider helping teammates as more of a direct exchange or more as a generalized exchange. Uh, in this paper, I argue that individuals Pro-social orientation is one of such factors. So pro-socials or individuals high on pro-social orientation or the givers, as we call them, are more likely to think of helping teammates as part of a generalized exchange, whereas the non-pro-socials or the non-givers are more likely to think of helping teammates as part of a direct exchange between specific individuals. And because of such differences, I would argue that the givers and the non-givers would react differently um, when there is an unhelpful teammate in an otherwise helpful group. More sophistically, uh, I compare givers and non-givers in three different conditions. A cooperative group condition where all members actively help one another. Uh, a competent jerk condition where there is one competent yet selfish member that does not help other members while other members actively help one another. And lastly, a friendly incompetent condition where there is one uh, pro-social yet incompetent member that cannot help others because of lack of ability to help while everyone else actively helps another. Now, one possible prediction is that uh, is that <laughs> uh, one bad apple in a barrel, uh, whether it's a competent jerk or a friendly incompetent, is not enough to really challenge the group norm of cooperation. And so um, there may be no difference uh, between the, the different conditions for both the pro-socials and the non-pro-socials. Another possible outcome is that one bad apple is in fact influential enough to really challenge the group norm on cooperation. And so the, uh, the norm around cooperation becomes weaker in competent jerk and in friendly and competent condition compared to the cooperative group condition. And so the non-prosocials uh, would act less prosocially, meaning they would help less because the social forces that were kind of enforcing them to act pro-socially is now weaker, whereas the pro-socials would remain the same. Now, what I find in this study is in fact that it's the pro-socials, uh, the givers, who are most affected uh, by the deviant member uh, and not the non-pro-socials. So um, uh, as expected by previous studies, I do find that the, the, the pro-socials are more likely to help others than the non-pro-socials in a cooperative condition. However, this positive effect of pro-social um, pro orientation disappears in a competent jerk condition, whereas this becomes actually stronger in a friendly incompetent condition. The main argument of the paper is that these differences arise due to their different perceptions on ex, uh, exchange structure of teammate helping. Now, um, 
from previous research, we know that the non-prosocials or people who are low at um, prosocial orientation are more likely to make judgments in terms of individual rationality, and they strive for their own best personal outcome. So when they do help their teammates, or any um, individual for that matter, they're more likely to do so um, as with this pre pre <laughs> yes, pre pre my mentality, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> uh, uh, so they're helping so that they can get help back in return, right? Whereas the uh, pro-socials, the people who are high on pro-social orientation, are, are known to make judgments using collective rationality, and they internalize the goal of the collective. And so when they help their teammates, um, they're helping with this paying it forward sort of mentality where they're helping um, their teammate because this teammate is part of your community, part of your group, and they need help. And in return, um, these teammates are expected to help other teammates that, are ne that need help in the near future. Um, so, in a direct exchange, any individual that does not reciprocate is not an attractive um, potential exchange partner. So for non-prosocials, uh, whether it's um, because of their lack of uh, competence or because of their selfishness, any uh, member that would not reciprocate their help is not an active, uh, attractive exchange partner, so they would reduce their helping towards the friendly and competent as well as the, uh, the competent jerk, whereas they would remain the same uh, to the other members that remain helpful. For the prosocials, they um, view helping teammates as a generalized exchange, and in generalized exchange, uh, the, uh, the exchange partner is not necessarily the specific individuals, but it's uh, the group as a collective. Now, when there is a competent jerk in this group, the, uh, the prosocials would um, lose trust in the collective, uh, the exchange system as a whole, and as a result, they would refrain from helping the competent jerk and the other members that are in the group. Whereas in the, um, in the friendly and competent condition, the prosocials would perceive that the group's need for help has uh, increased. So they would increase their help towards the group by helping this incompetent, uh, friendly incompetent, even though um, this person may not reciprocate to the same extent. And I test these um, hypotheses using a um, computer scripted online game. Now, uh, the game itself is a find a hidden object game where you uh, are supposed to find the, the objects that are assigned to you and you get points for that. Uh, the participant, there were uh, 600 participants, 200 participants per condition. Uh, the, the, uh, the participants were led to believe that they were playing with three other players, as you can see here. Uh, however, these were um, program bots, right? So by using program bots rather than real participants or confederate, I was able to better manage their gaming experience in the sense that um, individuals, participants that were um, assigned to the same condition would have almost a very identical game experience. Right? Uh, so in the game, uh, the participants were able to help one another. Well, the, the players were able to help one another by sending these hints uh, on the message board. Now, so for instance, I might find where footprint is while I'm looking for one of the assigned objects. And I might decide that I would send um, a hint to player three so that this player can find the footprint easier and get points for that, okay? So the main dependent variable that I look at is the number of hints that um, people give. And as mentioned, there's this positive effect on social value orientation, meaning that people high on pro-social orientation are more likely to help compared to the people who are low on, um, on pro-social orientation. However, there's this interaction effect where uh, the, the positive effect disappears in the competent jerk condition, 
and it becomes stronger and differently in competent condition. Now, in the game, uh, if they manage, if the participants manage to find all the signs object uh, in the time limit, they were able, they were asked to choose between taking an individual bonus and tapping out of the game or um, staying in the game, foregoing the individual bonus, and continue to help other members so that they can find their assigned clues. So in this sense, taking an individual bonus was the non-process social behavior uh, in the game. Now, and as you can see here in the logistic regression, the, um, the pro-socials were less likely to choose the individual bonus compared to the non-pro-socials. And again, you see that this effect is, becomes actually, this um, effect disappears or becomes weaker in the friendly incompetent condition, right? Now, um, I look at affective attachment that the participants report after playing the game towards their team, uh, as well as the gratefulness they feel towards their teammate after playing the game. And again, I find a very similar pattern where the pro-socials would report higher level of affective attachment and they would feel more grateful towards their teammates. However, this, um, this effect disappears in the competent jerk condition and it becomes stronger in the, oh, it doesn't really become stronger in the the incompetent condition, but yes, there's this weaker uh, effect of competent jerk condition. Now, I also looked at uh, perceived team conflict because it could be that the pro-socials are especially um, sensitive to any selfish act and the non-pro-socials are just not that sensitive to it so that they don't realize that this, there's this competent jerk in the, in the team. However, it seems like that wasn't the case. Both the pro-socials and non-pro-socials perceived that there was some sort of conflict in the team. However, it didn't really affect the pro-social behaviors of the non-pro-socials or the non-givers, whereas it really affected the pro-socials. Now, it's another, another very interesting result is that um, the number of objects found would be how well they performed in the team, right? And you can see here that um, both competent jerk condition and friendly and competent jerk condition has this negative effect compared to a cooperative condition. Um, and this was true for both the non-givers and the givers, which means that if you have any type of unhelpful member in a team, it would affect uh, your, uh, your teammates' performance in a very negative way. Right? So um, the, it, and overall, the paper shows that um, individuals' pro-social orientation affects their perceived exchange structure um, in, in helping teammates. And as, as a result, um, they would react differently when there is an unhelpful member in the team. Now, um, it, it is one of the very few studies that look at how individual factors and contextual factors uh, interact to shape pro-social behaviors. And I also want to mention that um, while most of the studies that look at this interaction um, focuses on how um, social forces uh, affect the non-pro-socials and not really the pro-socials, but this paper shows that um, in certain con certain contextual changes would actually affect the pro-socials even more so than they affect the non-pro-socials. And lastly, um, uh, this, this, uh, this very well-known quote of like, don't tolerate brilliant jerks. The paper actually shows that it's not just that uh, one bad apple spoiled the barrel sort of a story, but it's actually that this, having this brilliant jerk in the group will demotivate the givers in the group from, from giving. All right, so that's it. Okay, thank you.
sorry, I'll start with the first question then. Um, and that's for Sumin. Um, so my question to you was, uh, is about the assumption that tight cultures reinforce masculine uh, leadership behavior. So I'm wondering about contexts where you might have a tight culture that's about uh, stereotypically female leadership traits. And I'm wondering whether the fact that you got data from a bank you know, might have um, fit the story, but whether that's a generalized theory or not. Curious to hear your thoughts. Sorry. I think that that comes out a lot. Um, the 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 thing with our study, we weren't able to determine whether that that was a norm, or the value, right, or the attitudes that people had. And I think that's one of the issues with just looking at tight versus loose cultures. We're just looking at, you know, how much people agree on the culture. But yeah, I mean, if it was a culture that agreed on feminine norms then we're probably not going to see what we, we saw. But I think that's a really interesting question, given the bank, I, you know, would that be a more feminine or more masculine culture? I mean, it would be a very procedures-based type of organization, right, which is, would probably be, um, I don't know, relatively a tight culture, and I'm not sure whether it would be more masculine or feminine. Um, maybe the, you know, in a, in a, uh, with, with I, I don't want to go into like stereotyping different branches, but yeah, I mean, if it's a, if it values femininity, then I think we will we would see these defects attenuate. So. Oh. Yeah, I have yeah. Uh, sorry. yeah, so I have a few questions. The first one is for is for Paul, and I guess that for for all of the authors in the in the paper. Yes, for Paul. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I guess that you can jump in. The the question is that you're kind of predicting the future. You're predicting something very amazing. So you predict that who are going to be the innovators, and there's going to be a premium in owning the stock. So you own, you have like a nice investment vehicle. So so my observation would be, would you would you be able to bet? Let's say you run the model until 2019. You say, yeah, let's bet 2020. Let's bet 2021. And can you pre-register, pre-register, pre-register that? So if uh, I could, I'm not sure I'd be here right now. I'd be off on Wall Street. <laughs> But, um, but that's what the question is academic because it's it's not investment. It's just you're you're trying to say that we can predict. So so if that's the case, you should be able to do this exercise and be able to show yes, we do better. We can predict innovation because you. That's kind of that's the question. So in order for the model to function, I need the the future time period. So I need to know what discourse was in 2016 to predict who's going to be those peop those companies or those individuals who lead to the rise. And I don't see any relationship between this prescience measure that's calculated from 2011 to 2016 and stock returns for that company after 2016. So it really doesn't seem to be like a core attribute of the firm. It's rather just they happen to be in the right place at the right time, or they had the right confluence of events that led the, the CEO to be on the forefront of this, this company. Because we see no relationship with firm performance metrics and prescience. It seems more to be that these firms are just in unique positions, and I think there's a lot of work that can be done in the future exploring what are the, the events that lead an individual or a firm to be in the position to be pressured. Yeah. Yeah. If there is there's someone else, I guess that, yeah. Oh, sorry, a couple of questions. One is, uh, prescience kind of has two meanings. One is sort of um, being ahead of your time, which is I think what you measure, and the other is uh, being able to see the future, which your sort of Tim Cook example was more that kind of prescience. Um, can, you, can you discriminate those two things? So it's something we're still working on, is figuring out exactly what prescience is, both how we're conveying the meaning of what we mean when we say prescience in terms of the presentation, but also what are these firms who are prescient, what are they doing? Um, it doesn't seem to be the case that prescience is these shapers, these high status organizations that are kind of coercing everyone into using their discourse because we don't see that the large established organizations are the prescient ones, um, but rather that it's coming from these smaller organizations actually that don't have as much market power, as much status as, as may be the case. Mm -hmm. um, with regards to really, I'm not, I'm not sure. It's something that we're still trying to think through. I had a question from Michael as well, if I can. Can I just, I want to, okay. so I was thinking, I mean, related to Michael's point and your response, um, two things. One is so, and you pointed to this at the 
end part of your presentation. So it's not about like brute force coercion, but it's not luck. Is it like I guess is it strategy? Do you think these people just? I mean, there's some luck to it, but they actually have the strategy, and you know, it's a highly variable, you know, distribution of whether or not they're going to get it right or not. But if they get it right, they get it right. Do you think that's what's actually happening? And the second part is, you look at five years. What if you look 10 years, 20 years? Are there firms, because I know firms now are like really trying to look really forward and taking the long bet. Like is, do you, could you get data? If you got data, would you expect similar results? So I already kind of forgot the first question. Um, so I'll answer the second one, and maybe we can go back to it. Um, because I, like, I think that question of really long time horizons is fascinating in my mind. Just States on that because you can imagine certainly there'd be a, a penalty for firms who are thinking too far in advance right you take Pablo Picasso and you put him in like the, the 1840s he's not going to be as successful an artist as he is being positioned in the cultural era where his work was appreciated and for the same time these firms were talking about digital streaming in an era where it's still dial up broadband these companies aren't going to have successful market performance so I think it's about being just far enough ahead of the curve that you're able to to have this performance boost that's valued in the market. We, we, yes, do you think it's, I mean, I'm not saying it's completely intentional and these guys are like, you know, 99% certain that this is gonna happen. But it seems to be more than just luck, I mean, if you're finding your result. Um, but is there any qualitative evidence, for instance, maybe that like, that these people know they, they might be prescient? Like obviously they're trying to say, this is what we think is gonna happen in the future. Um, any evidence of why they think that or anything like that? There's some strategy behind it. Yeah, so the firms that end up being prescient, they, they're using more perplexed language. The firms that are really nailing down using the very conventional language the very standardized practices in these quarterly earnings calls, these firms tend to not be as prescient or particularly less likely to be these very highly prescient organizations. So I think it's some knowledge or some idea that we need to take a risk in order to, to see the future. Yeah, uh, Michael, I thought really interesting in that you have a, a really strong result, you yep. know? I mean, you have lots of plausible hypotheses and right. one is just way out there. Yep. And I, w I, my memory is a little slippery, but um, what was it that the creativity level of your genre, was that, was that the really big one? Yes, so, so the, your, the neighbors, your genre or the, the people okay. that uh, are affiliated with the same genres, yeah. But you're and you're across all kinds of music, so classical, hip hop, across all. So we run models with all of that. So the controls and the and the results I showed you, controlled for classical and jazz. We also run models without those because those tend to be the most. Uh, the distribution is just pushed to the right, but yeah. a lot of the other distributions um, are actually more or less consistent. Um, so the results pretty much the same when we take those out. And do you think the the concept of um, cultural tightness is relevant there that you know you have a, a genre where you you know whatever you do it has to be different from what's been done before as opposed to you know change one thing at a time if that yeah I guess I, I never thought about it in those terms but maybe that could work certainly I think there's some you know when I say like it's the creativity of the altars or the creativity of the neighbors that's really driving it in this cultural sphere, we don't, I mean, I assume that there's, it's some normative effect. Like there's a norm of being creative that's accepted, it's expected, it's rewarded. Um, but there could be an affective component. It could be, we don't actually measure what's actually going on there. So I'm, I'm not sure. Um, but I'll need to think more about it. Yeah, maybe it is, you know, maybe that there's some tightness. I'm thinking about like, you know, grunge in the 19, early 1990s. You know, or like prog rock in the, and we, I've looked, we've looked at particular genre level effects as well, and we find this, you know, like prog rock in the late 60s, early 70s. There's just some moments in time, and in particular genres, uh, where these things seem to blow up, and there's a lot of creativity going around. Oh, sorry. Thanks. Thank you. <coughs> Question for Yunjin. Um, uh, I, I missed uh, how you measure social, uh, pro-social orientation. Uh, so it's a clarification question. And then my question is about, um, so um, I play as a, as a player with three bots in the game. And what I missed was the uh, pro-social or non-pro-social orientation of these bots. Or have you played with this just to try to create uh, actually different configurations? 
Right, so um, the pro-social orientation, I use the social value orientation measure um, invented by Van Lang. I'm not sure if I'm TDM, pronouncing so their um, last name correctly, but um, yes, and, and I think it's one of the most widely used measure in the literature. So before participants play the game, before they, they actually see the game, they um, answer a bunch of um, pre-questionnaires and this was one of the things they answered. Um, so it's your innate, the, the pro-social orientation that you bring into the study as a participant. Now, the bots, um, so there were three other bots. Um, so in a cooperative condition, they all acted very pro-socially and I did try to change how actively they help, the number of helps they given. And, and um, so I did s try several different versions of it, but um, in, the, in, the, um, in the results, I also control for the number of helps that were given and received as well. And in the different conditions, so for instance, in the competent or condition and in the uh, friendly and competent or co condition, um, player one who was at the, the, the bottom, right bottom of the, the participant that was playing would always play that part. So um, that was to try to minimize the differences between players with, across the conditions. So, um, and, and the two other players would remain exactly the same across conditions. So, so right, right, right. So there were several things that a jerk did, but um, so for instance, in one case, the, the player one who would play either the jerk or the friendly incompetent would ask, hey, I'm tr having trouble finding X, could you guys help? And then um, another bot would react, it's there, it's uh, behind the, the leaves or something. And in the co uh, cooperative condition, the, um, the, uh, the, the player would say, oh, I'm still having trouble, can you explain more? They would explain more and then the, they would find it. Uh, in the competent jerk condition, the, the jerk would say something very snarky, like your um, hints are not that great, I'm not really sure what you're talking about. And then the uh, jerk would find it eventually, but, but um, would not engage in helping other people. Um, and they would always take the individual bonus, which was a very salient um, signal that they're being very selfish. And in the friendly and competent condition, um, you know, this, this player would continue to ask, but be very apologetic about it. I'm very sorry, I really am trying, but I really can't find it. And when other people would ask for help, um, they would respond, oh, I would keep an eye for it. Um, this is really hard. Uh, and, you know, smiley and winky face or something like that. Yes, 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 yes. In the pre, um, I mean, post survey. Hi, uh, this is a question for Stefan. Um, so, you know, y you measure deviation from the average firm, and I'm, I'm kind of pushing you to, to, to think a little bit more about what this means and why, what are perhaps the mechanisms that are informing or generating the results that you're seeing, because, in, you know, the average firm is also the, the median, kind of the mediocre firm, is not necessarily the successful firm, so, and often, at least in how companies that uh, put an emphasis on their culture, um, um, they try to emphasize the fact that they're different and that they're, they're, they're different from, from, from this mediocrity. And to, to extend Michael's, more, uh, Michael's question earlier on, uh, on the music scene, maybe it varies by different types of industries. You know, some industries are tighter or looser, and, and therefore there are, in some industries there's greater return to being deviant where there are other industries where there are, there are fewer returns and whether that relates to the processes that happen inside the organizations or how outside stakeholders respond to deviants, which is are entirely different mechanisms. Okay, so uh, I hope I get all the questions. Um, so first of all, this idea of using industry averages was driven by an empirical observation. So when I look at the distribution of culture scores, I indeed find somewhat of a clustering down, uh, around a mean uh, industry culture. So when I use the median industry uh, culture, I would receive very similar results. 
Similarly, so you might also think that it matters how strongly um, cultures differ within an industry. So I also scaled um, this deviation by the degree of general variation, which again, I find very similar results, um, supporting this idea that you know starting from industry averages is a good benchmark um, for um, what's the dominant cultural traits of an industry. Um, and you had another question? Yeah, but exactly. So I didn't find a clear pattern here. So in fact, it seems to be fairly consistent across industries. So my question is related to theory because mm -hmm. you didn't. You showed that a lot of um, nice, very, very nicely done empirics. Yeah. But what is the theory behind? I think that's connected to what Amir is saying. Yeah. You showed us a bit of theory when you interact with differ differentiation, yeah. but then you inform for which firm it doesn't has a penalty, but for which it does and why, and what are the mechanisms, I think that that can help you, I don't know, sort these issues a bit better. Yeah, yeah. so, so um, again, so when we think of an industry, there are different contingencies to which um, a firm needs to react. So for instance, um, how much interconnectivity there is between workers. So if you have a production process where there is much interconnectivity, you also should emphasize teamwork between workers. And if this is not the case, then it's not that important. So, which might be a bit more far-fetched, um, is the idea that um, of person fit. So for instance, within an industry, you might have particular types that you need to address with a particular kind of culture. So the idea there is that the industry has like an ideal culture. Exactly. So that's so a theoretical idea. So, so that is, this is the contingency theory idea. Yeah. So you might think of this, um, you have a completely homogeneous industry, so only the um, industry characteristic matters. So if this were the case, um, then we would have one ideal culture. And now what I started to do, you know, is also implement that firms might be different by this idea of product differentiation. Could I ask you a quick follow-on question related to that, which is, um, so if, if you're thinking about an ideal culture for the industry, have you thought about weighting your distance measure based on uh, the performance of the other firms? Yeah, so um, I did something very similar, which is a deviation to the top performers, mm -hmm. and um, there I got very similar results. So I stick with, with the idea of looking at industry averages, because you might think um, that, um, you know, the the, the finding that being close to the ideal cultural types is not that surprising. So you just copy the, the best practices. A follow up for Paul and you all about your the last point you made. I've been thinking about it. So this like proximate prescience versus like more distant prescience. And I like I understand if you're interested in market performance, future performance, like you, you'd want to be just at the vanguard. You don't want to be too far ahead. But as someone who's interested in creativity and like innovation and generation of ideas, I feel like for, so the, I was thinking about the Picasso example, for every new idea, there's a martyr who created something, you know, I'm thinking rock and roll. Like there's someone, you know, there were African-American artists in the 1940s doing stuff that was necessary for Buddy Holiday to come out, you know, in 1955 with his music, what was considered rock and roll. And those artists weren't successful and it wasn't until generations later that they were really recognized for their generativity, which is a kind of, a kind of prescience, I think. So in, it's a different kind of outcome, maybe not normative success or market success, but essential nonetheless when we think about these things. Any thoughts about that and for anyone? Really? I think that's really opening up the, the power of these new methods, like using textual data or, or your work using the genre classifications of music. Because now that we're able to deconstruct these cultural contents into their, their features, we can see like, really what are the origins of what we're observing, where is it coming from, and what are the rewards. So the reason I really emphasize this winner-take-all feature in the data is that I think it's a fascinating cultural process that firms that are at the 90th percentile of prescience don't perform any better than firms at the 25th percentile. It's the same with academic publications where you might see like some scientists who are really, really good, but just because they're not 
at that breakthrough pace to compete, they're not receiving all the awards that are going to the, the top tier of, of scientists. And now we can begin to unpack these cultural processes and observe what are the, the real foundations. And I think that there's a lot of potential there. Yeah, I mean, there is a difference, though. I think that in the <coughs> um, objective description or depiction of the different features in the music genres, um, you reach something closer to, um, I don't know, uh, realism. I mean, whereas you put lots of pressure on what CEOs say as being representative of the of this reality, and I think that this makes a, a difference, epistemologically speaking, probably. I think that's a great point. Um, and one of the projects that I'd want to work on with this data is to actually try to extract strategies from this text. So you see in the Prussian sentences that there are very concrete examples of what the firm is doing. And then this project doesn't really, it's agnostic to the content. It's just how well is it predicted. A any idea, sorry, because this gives me another idea maybe for you. Uh, any, uh, any attempt at just trying to connect uh, with uh, Philippe Berg kind of story about uh, uh, through uh, word um, associations just to generate pairs or actually uh, more than pairs of competitors based uh, on... Uh, are you talking about the, the, the product statements from the yeah, case? Yeah, yeah. Um, we used that data and we saw no relationship um, between how product differentiated you were and what your organizational prescience was. But I think if you want to talk after this, I'd be more than happy to hear your thoughts. I have a question for Stefan. Um, so the data you present is, is cross-sectional. And, huh? Oh, it is longitudinal? Um, are you using organizational fixed effects? So, so I'd be really interested to know whether it's at these that the culture is shaping to fit the industry or whether the firms are being selected on their cultures. And I'm wondering if you put any thought into the process that leads to the outcome you're observing. So again, in the interest of time, I didn't have time to look at the longitudinal stuff. Um, so um, I in fact look, so you might think um, deviations to industry averages can change in two, two ways. So either you get copies by all of your competitors or you get closer to the industry averages. And in fact, I find at least small positive effects for productivity and profitability if you, me uh, if you move closer to the industry averages. So effects are smaller, which is not surprising because we know culture change is laborious and costly. But on the other hand, if you get copied by your competitors, this, is not, this has no positive benefits. If anything, the effects are even negative. So you might think of this, so you might discover like a cultural premier, and now everyone else, else copies you, copies your culture, now this culture premier uh, disappears or, sh or shrinks. Hi, my question's for Paul. Um, I don't think I caught the time frame in which you collected the data of the transcripts. Um, but with the, your, the beginning of your presentation talking about seeing the future, I was surprised to see financial services at the top of the list for like industries that led in impressions because I was wondering if your data caught 2008 and if, you, if your data has the power to predict market events, maybe things like overconfidence in those transcripts, that could be important in predicting huge events like that. So the data begins in 2006. Um, but for this project, we restrict calls to 2011 precisely because if you go before that, you're really getting into the aftermath of the financial crisis. Um, we haven't done too much work exploring a lot of the topics that you're talking about, um, but there's certainly the potential is there. The, the main concern that we have is that there really isn't a lot of data um, prior to 2011, just like the number of calls is a third as many in 2010 as 2011, but the data ranges from 2006 to 2016. It's just, it's very back-weighted in terms of the frequency of the calls we have available. So, um, Suman, another question for you, if I, if I may, which is, um, you mentioned that there are, uh, there's a lot of variation um, across the branches that you have access to. I forget the number of branches. It's over, over 100, as I recall. And I'm just wondering if you've looked at any relevant 
variation across those branches, for example, in like the gender composition of employees and whether there might be something to be done there to exploit that variation to understand um, how that might affect your outcomes. So you mean the variation across the different branches of this bank? Of uh, this bank, yeah. Because uh, your data come from not just, they're coming from, from a lots of different branches, right? It, yeah, but from the same bank. Same bank, but, mm -hmm, but I just, mm -hmm. I'm not sure how much variation there might be at the branch level, whether you could exploit some of that. Uh, I, I think there is qu quite a bit of variation, actually. Yeah, but we haven't actually looked into that, but um, certainly something we can look at, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's also a Korean bank, and so there's some, I mean, relative homogeneity, but, you know, there is variation in the culture and also in also the variation in, in composition, yeah. yeah. So, but, yeah, definitely. All right, let's take one last question, and then we'll, then we'll take a break. Thanks. Mine's actually also for Suman. Uh, um, so I was thinking about the kind of some of the frames that you were using, some of the the language, um, in particular, like perceived negative attitude, or that um, these women were, you know, worried about being judged or treated unfairly. And I'm curious about the choice to frame it around their worry as opposed to their experiences, right? Because we know that, you know, if a uh, if a stereotype of a successful leader is like made in the image of masculinity, right? Then like actually those things really do happen, right? Um, and I'm, I'm just curious if you can speak to that a little bit because I also noticed that the, the onus at the end was put on these female leaders to kind of assess the attitudes, right? Of their female and their male colleagues. Um, and I think, I'm, I'm curious if you also know of other studies or are curious about doing other studies where actually the onus is put on men to examine their biases, right? Or the culture to really examine what's happening in terms of the lived experiences and, and placing the onus differently, if that makes sense. Yeah, so I think uh, that's a really interesting question, perceptions versus experience. Um, I think our perceptions also influence what we experience or you know, how, how, you know, what we become sensitive to. And so, so yeah, in this particular, particular study, we looked at their perceptions, right? Like, so th that's why I was saying like we don't know for whether it is really the the, the case that the, the the culture is is has this expectation or the the subordinates has this expectation that women should be more directive or that they have these this negative attitude towards um, more feminine behaviors, and so 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 yeah so I you know the in terms of. I think if it is an experience, it would be would probably reinforce. I mean, if we we, we ask our participants if they've had a, an encounter where you know feminine behavior was negatively sort of viewed or, or they were penalized for that, then I think we would see um, even stronger stronger effects. Um, there isn't very much literature on looking at men, I think. I think if there are other experts in this field, I mean, it's definitely a lot more focused about women and how they respond um, uh, and, and what they do and how they decide. I think um, there is maybe more, um, uh, even with leadership um, uh, research on whether one leadership type is is better than the other. There's also not a lot of uh, research. So yeah. So in terms of whether how men, uh, what men should do, and what sort of the structural change that should happen, there really isn't as much research um, there. So maybe the next paper. Yeah. I mean, absolutely. There's just so much uh, that we need to explore. 